Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds, and I'm sorry we do not have Ted and Nate for you this week. I'm back. Uh, I've wrestled back the controls from them, and today I'm hanging out with special guest Robert Aducci. Am I saying that right? That's right, yeah. And co-host uh, Doug Vahovic, our staff writer and uh, assistant in chief and editor over on the website there. Hello. Oh, both of these guys I got to hang out with over the, over the weekend and meet in person for the very first time. Uh, we I don't believe we've really uh, we've uh, we have we've corresponded by email uh, previously, Robert. Yeah. But you know this that was the first time us meeting in person, yep. which yep. is really cool because I you know, got to meet a lot of people for the first time in person over at Origins, as well as I've never actually met Doug, Doug in person either. So nice. <laughs> it was uh, it was a good weekend. So uh, how did you enjoy Origins, sir? I know you were working. Yeah, yeah, I was working a lot, but uh, but I had a really, really good time. Uh, last year I went as a player, and it was the first year um, I had gone. Um, and this year I was working, and you know I've done um, run a lot of games for uh, for Dave Christ at Ball Mind Games. So um, and they're the same people that run Origins, uh, the D and D section anyway. So I um, you know it was very comfortable. I knew everybody there, so it just felt like another con. Um, you know I've run at Winter Fantasy and Gen Con and all that stuff for Dave. So. Um, but it was always great to meet new people, play new games. You know, we did the D and D open, um, helped out with uh, setting up and and tweeting out some of the streaming stuff because this was uh, the first time they had done live streaming uh, for Maze Arcana and the D and D team and everything. So that was all pretty cool. Yeah, that that D and D room was hopping, man. There was a lot of stuff yeah. going on all weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I got to I got to be uh, Rudy and Satine's lackey for a little while and help them set oh, yeah. things up and. Uh, yeah, yeah. Be an over glorified gopher, <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Uh, so did you did you get involved in any of the special encounter stuff? Uh, no, so they already had me set up to do the streaming for the open. So um, we, they had uh, they had pulled some other people to do the special encounters and that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. So do you want to tell us about Adventure League? And since we're just coming off Origins specifically, you know, towards you know the Adventure League at the con, Origins specific, wherever you want to go with it. Sure. So Adventures League in general is, you know, organized play for D&D. &D. It's a way for people to um, to get involved in like a larger campaign. Um, and they're it's it's really wide open now um, before it used to kind of just be stores. Um, but we've opened it so it can be stores, it can be conventions, it can be home games. Um, so as long as like the DM is running by Adventures League rules and, and that's pretty much D and D rules. It's just that there's a couple other little things to make sure that you know that it's even across the board for everybody. So when you play at one place, like if you play in a home game that uses Adventures League rules, and then you go to a convention, that the rules are pretty much going to be you know the similar. So there's we don't use house rules or anything like that. We have like a standard way to create a character. Like instead of rolling three uh, d six, you choose uh, an array or you do the point by. Um, and so it just kind of evens things out. Um, and then there's ways to distribute magic items that way. It's sort of fair for everybody. Um, and so you can play that, you know, at a con and then take that same character and go to a home adventures league game and play that as well. So all, all with the same characters. Now, how long have you been doing adventure league for? Uh, I started when D and D fifth edition started, we started adventures league. So it was like right away. Um, they had asked us, you know, they'd put a call out for people to be admins about six months or eight months before um, before it actually premiered. Um, and we got, uh, you know, I put my resume in. I'd done some uh, community management for some Kickstarters and some various other things. And so uh, I put my resume in, resume in and they asked me to be the community manager for the Adventures League. Oh, sweet. So what exactly does the community manager do? Uh, so I basically anything that kind of you see online, I am usually involved with it. So, uh, you know, I moderate the, um, uh, the, the Facebook group, the Google plus group. I do the, the Facebook page, the Twitter page. Um, the website is mostly me, although like Adam or Adam Allen is our, um, uh, he's the associate community manager and he actually handles all the back end. Um, he's like a Linux guru guy. So he handles the back end of the, um, of the website and uh he's put out a bunch of articles and really all of the all of the other admins so there are six of us in total that are sort of like we're like the dms for the for the, the league in general like any kind of decisions that like a dm would normally make in a home game like we do that and disseminate it to everybody and so all of the other admins you know they do various jobs like uh travis and claire 
they handle uh, the editing and content management. And then Bill and Greg, Bill Benham and Greg Marks handle the, um, like the resource management. So like if we're giving uh, adventures and premieres and epics out to different conventions and stores, um, they handle uh, distributing that. They also wrangle all of our authors and stuff. So everybody has a, a different job, but then we also all come together um, to, to manage stuff. So like all of the admins, you know, you'll see us all on the Facebook groups talking, um, you know, at answering questions and whatnot. So if I ever get distracted, it's usually because of the chat. Sure, so uh, sure. people are talking about recognizing you from Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so BMG, what it, that's, the com that's the company that actually runs Adventure League, correct? Uh, no. Or they uh, just so run the cons? They, yeah, they just run um, some of the conventions. So we work in tandem with them. Um, they're a separate company um, that is owned by Dave Christ. And, uh, and then the Herald's Guild is like the nonprofit that they have that um, – that handles all the, the the DMs to get um, to get DMs for all those uh, com or all those conventions that he does, and Wizards just contracts with him to to do those big cons to organize them. Gotcha. So so this was actually my first time playing Adventure League. I had uh, never been in an Adventure League game before. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug sat in the game together, and it seemed to go pretty smoothly. That they seemed to get people together and in games fairly quickly. And and you know the GM that we had was really good. Good. He was a lot of fun. You know, he even had the challenge of dealing with a bit of a a, uh, a rascal with his eleven year old that showed up at the table. <laughs> yeah. uh, which he was, you know, both you know both of them were great. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, for our first time. You want to weigh in, Doug? Yeah, I was going to say, I actually started, I got back into D&D through the Adventures League when I lived in Texas, and uh, yeah, that, that's, I've had a great experience with it. It's like, you just show up, hop right in, uh, you know, the DMs are really great, and it's kind of like informed my home game, which is like, you know, that basic kind of like the standard array and that kind of stuff, it just mm -hmm. kind of smooths over. But uh, yeah, I was, I loved at Origins, but the D&D area was definitely the juice for me. I love mm -hmm. jumping in those games. And I've used several Adventures League, you know, just the modules just in my home game because it's like I know how long they're going to be about. You know, so it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I need a two-hour, you know, adventure for these players. It's yeah. like, oh, I'll just go on DM Skilled and find one. And, and yeah. I love the community. We actually, uh, actually, before we even started, we had a really good question from uh, Ryan Parker. Mm-hmm. Could Robert talk about the convention created content program regarding how it was had been received by the conventions and how it tied into the AL program? And that was actually pretty interesting because when we we jumped in was you know one of the uh, five parts of the sneak peek. I kind of wish we would have been able would have had time to do them all. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have uh, we have a lot of uh, different adventures for people to play, different kinds of adventures for people to play. Um, so we started out just doing like four hour adventures and only the people, uh, only the authors that the Adventures League chose um, could write Adventures League content. Um, and then we switched it up to like have the short one hour adventures. Plus we started doing two hour adventures. And then, you know, uh, we also actually had some eight hours at the beginning, but we've since cut those down to like a couple four hours. So even doing that, it was like one or two adventures would come out a month from us. And, you know, some people really wanted more content than that. You know, for some people, that's probably plenty of content, but then you have, you know, more hardcore people that want to play more often. And that's either, again, once we open it up to home games, it made people, made playing easier. So again, people wanted to play more uh, and were able to play more often. And so in order to, um, in order to fac facilitate that, we uh, came up with the con created content program. And what that means is conventions can reach out to us and apply to create Adventures League legal content. Uh, and so they have to have a pretty good lead time, like nine months in front of their convention um, in, order to, in order to be improved for that. Uh, they just fill out this form. They tell us, uh, you know, what tier they want to play with. So, excuse me, uh, what tier they want to write for. So like one to four, uh, five to 10, 11 to 16, and so on. Um, and then give us like a short blurb, you know, like the blurbs we have are like, you know, two or three sentences of what the adventure is about maybe what magic items it's going to have. Uh, we look at those, we approve them, um, and then then they need to give us an outline of the adventure. We approve those, and then they write them. And we really don't have, we really don't put a lot of, um, a lot of time into reviewing them just because there's so many that are coming in. I think Bill said he had like 60 on the list. And so 
for Greg and Bill to review that it would just take way too much time. So we don't usually edit them a whole lot uh, unless they're kind of things that are kind of glaring out of canon, like, oh, you've got a machine gun or something like that. Um, and then, so they premiere those at their adventure, at their conventions. They can also, what, what, what a lot of conventions are doing are trading content. So if your con, um, you know, does an adventure and my con does an adventure, we can switch them out and that way we both have additional content to run at our conventions. Um, and then after, I think four or six months, I can't remember what the timeline is, um, but after a certain uh, period of, uh, you know, once they premiere, then they need to go up on the DMs Guild um, for anyone to purchase and play and run. Oh, excellent. So, so, ba so it all gets, you know, regurgitated right into the DMs go for people to have more. Pro that, that's kind of, that's pretty cool too. Are, are there any like stipulations or rules as far as like how they have to sell that in the DMs guild? Um, I don't, I don't think there are no, but I mean, we've, we've pretty much found that the, you know, the $3 and kind of $5, uh, are, are pretty much our good prices. Uh, now, of course, some convention, some some of the concrete content, you know, will have like custom art, um, custom maps, and stuff like that. And so, a lot of times, those will raise the prices up a little bit. So, people, you know, our our, our baseline is kind of like the the three and five dollars. But if people want to charge a little bit more, they can. We're not going to tell them they can't charge something for their adventure. But you know, if somebody were were to like uh, try to work the system and be like, oh, our adventure is a thousand dollars, that way nobody buys it that you know that you know we would have an issue with that but <laughs> gotcha gotcha some so of those things oh sorry no go ahead doug some of those and the dms go they're a really good value too just a couple weeks ago i bought the harried and hills fire it's like 45 page thing and it was only like four dollars so i mean that's yeah. a ton of adventure packed into that mm -hmm. for sure for sure yeah. so the uh, the concept of the uh, I, I'm really digging the concept of the cons trading the content back and forth. Has has any of them done them as like a serial yet? Where like hey you know this con the cons you know they're going to happen in a sequence anyway. Mm -hmm. Is you know so why not like run it through that from one con to the to to the next? You could kind of like play a serial adventure. So there are some cons that have sort of grouped together. Um, so Baldwin Games runs you know. He, he runs uh, Winter Fantasy, Origins, and then uh, the Gen Con portion of D&D. So he's got three cons. And then also the people that are like his head people that run, um, that, that organize stuff, uh, they also run their own cons too on, on the East Coast. Like um, I can't think of any of the names of them right now, of course. But so I think they, um, they have definitely tied a bunch of them in. Um, on top of that, uh, there is a... Facebook group and a, um, a Slack channel that's for con created content. So if you're writing con created content, you can join these and it allows people to coordinate. So one of the things with the con created content is that it's like one of the stipulations is that it has to be in a specific region. So when the Adventures League started, we were in Faerun and we and we were only around the Moon Sea region of Faerun. So there's this big inner sea, inner, you know, uh, inland sea. And then there's all these kind of little frontier sort of towns around the, the sea. And we, that's where all of our adventures um, took place. Uh, Wizards eventually wanted us um, to move away from that and to follow like the main storyline. So we've moved away from the Moon Sea, but we've given the Moon Sea region to the con created content. So one of the stipulations is if you're writing con created content, you've got to place it, it's got to be Moon Sea adjacent basically. And so there's, there's chats, there's always chats about, uh, you know, like, what are you doing in Hills Far? What are you doing in Flan? Whatever. So that when somebody writes content, then the next person who's going to write content can like, you know, read that content and, and, and maybe build off of it, use NPCs and that kind of thing. Kind of sneaky. <laughs> you guys keep, you know, keeping it flowing all over the, uh, all over Fey Run, you know, as mm -hmm. Wizards moves, uh, you know, the cons kind of have to still kind of follow along. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Zarif Gaming question: What is your favorite season of Adventure League so far? Um, like every season, kind of gets better and better. Um, I really like the dungeons from this season. I'm really, really excited about next season. Um, you know, the Tomb of Annihilation season is all going to be in Chult. Um, it's going to be a long season. So normally, our seasons have been like kind of February through September, and then September through February, kind of right around then. Uh, this season is going to be September through um, through May, so it's going to be about three months longer. Um, and we've got like 20 adventures this season or something like that. 
Um, and it's like, yeah, like I said, it's all in Schult with each each kind of tier. So tier, you know, level one through four, five through ten, um, eleven through sixteen, and then seventeen through twenty are all going to have a, a, a sort of a mini storyline that goes with them. And yet, there's going to be stuff that carries along through all of it. So. Yeah, I feel like this season is going to feel a lot less uh, fantasy generic than than the previ previous ones. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's I mean, going to be yeah in jungle, you know, with all these uh, these cool dinosaurs and undead dinosaurs and zombies, and yeah, it's, Schult definitely has its own own feel to it, the kind of lost world thing. Yeah, even in the even in the small adventure that we played in, I mean, you know, you had you know you had the you know, uh, spoilers maybe I don't know if we're supposed to give those away or not, but uh, you know we have we had what we, uh, what did the DM describe them like? Um, he called them goblin spiders. <laughs> yeah, is the description he used, and uh, which I don't think they're very goblin spider -y at all. But uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know there was actually like you know. Uh, flying lizard men you know mm -hmm. so i am not familiar i'm not familiar with i'm not even familiar with that monster really so you know like a terran lizard man that flies yeah yeah so th so that's something new mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i thought yeah uh, it'd be really cool yeah it was super flavorful i mean just the you know just that different feeling that you're not used to you know usually like the little hamlet or you know your village it was like you could really picture like a steamy jungle and this bustling market port city i forget the name of it but uh yeah yeah and kind of like what you were saying in response to dave as far as like your favorite season i mean they're just bound to get better every time as like not mm -hmm. only the the products that they're based on you know get refined and the process gets refined but the adventures league itself it's like you know how to you know you're just learning how to run events and and grow the community better and that has right. a huge impact on the whole you know the whole hobby mm -hmm. I yeah one of the things i mean you know just talking about you know growing and, and kind of learning so i um one of the things they want to do with the adventures league was sort of break away kind of from previous organized play you know there had been the rpga and lfr like uh, living forgotten realms and so they wanted to kind of break away from some of that and not totally because obviously there's a lot of great um knowledge and information and, and and experience in those and so what they did though is they they hired people sort of as like the primary admins that really didn't have a whole lot of experience with um, with all those other stuff to kind of, you know, break out the, uh, uh, the, the organization from previous kind of thought models. And so I, like, I had really never been involved with organized play. Um, I uh, obviously been playing D and D for 30 years, but just never played a lot of organized play. Um, I'd done a little bit for ashes of Athos in fourth edition. Um, so I'd done a little tiny bit and then I'd played here and there. Um, and then Bill and Travis, you know, they'd been, uh, I think they were triad members in, in the Living Greyhawk stuff. So they'd done a little bit, but not as much as our associates. So our associates, um, Greg Marks and uh, um, and Alan and uh, Claire, they've all been doing organized play for a long time. Like Claire for, I don't know, for 30 years or something, like a long time she's been doing organized play. So she has a lot of great experience. So they really, but, and they really wanted to stack that experience with people with new ideas. And so one of the you know first problems we kind of ran into was um, as a DM, you get experience for um, uh, you'd get experience for running games, but at first it was a really small amount, and like people, you know, we were not we were having trouble getting DMs because people didn't want to run; they want, more people want to play in general, and so we really had to entice people to to run. And so in order to do that, we sort of had to make um, running games um, have an equal reward to playing them. And so I came up with the um, the DM quest model. So you, you we, we a we raised like the base experience that DMs get, but also I added in a bunch of quests. So like, if you if you complete the hardcover, you get X. If you complete the hardcover plus all the D and D Adventures League PDF adventures, you get X. If you uh, you know if you play a game with more than half uh, or actually any any new players, you get this much bonus experience. Um, if, if it's more than half of the table is new players, you get this much. So it's like a bunch of achievements that DMs can get um, during the season uh, to, you know, while they run. That's really cool. Yeah, my, the first time I played, the DM was super excited. He's like, you've never played in Adventures League before? He's like, oh, yeah, because I got like a bonus. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, to me, it only makes sense that the DM would actually get more because 
you guys are never going to struggle for players, but you might, you know, you might have a hard time, you know, getting some uh, DMs to play. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, so, you know, giving them incentive only makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Bill from Comic Book University, also one of our staff writers, enough talk. I demand to see an exhibition of those exotic weapons on the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my orc weapons up there. Yeah, they're, they're actually, um, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, I don't think those are coming off anytime soon. My wife, like when she came down here when we first bought this house and I put the stuff up there, she was mm -hmm. like, I feel like those are going to fall off and <laughs> cut my head off every time I walk under them. So I was, <laughs> put them up there really good. So they're not, definitely not coming off. Not that we're going to have an earthquake or anything, but. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually thinking the sword kind of reminded me of uh, the artwork from like the fourth edition uh, Dragonborn. I always had those like totally. jagged looking weapons. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So uh, we have a question here. Uh, from Aradaz. So I'm not sure if it, so I'm not really understanding the question. Maybe you'll understand it because it might be something spe specific to Adventure League. Uh -huh. are, are there any plans of modifying the core books plus one stipulation for character creation? Sure. So yes, I do understand what he's asking. Um, and so what that is, is uh, one of the lessons uh, that we've learned in previous organized play is that, uh, you know, the designers for D&D, they cannot test all of the options with every other option that's out there for character creation, right? So um, to do that would just take too long and it's just it's just not something that's done. And so as a result, you know, in third edition, fourth edition, when a book came out and it was legal for play, you know, in the organized play program, you could use it. And so you could have, I don't know, just, you know any any kind of combination of powers from like the main player's handbook plus anything else you know featured in, 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 in subclasses and whatever that came out in other books you could put together and so what would happen is an interaction would happen between the rules that the designers never accounted for and the players would you know end up with insane you know insane abilities um that would sort of break the game and so in order to to um to make sure that doesn't happen for fifth edition um we put in uh, a rule called PHB plus one. So that means you can only make your character out from the PHB plus one other book. So you have to choose your plus one when you either when you create your character or when you use something from another book. So if I choose to play a race from Volo's Guide to Monsters, then that's my plus one. So I can make anything that uses those two books. But if I want to say, choose a um, choose one of the subclasses from the Sword Coast Adventures Guide, I can't do that if I chose to play a goblin from Volo's Guide. So it limits the interactions between the books because, again, they don't, they're only testing stuff with the player's handbook plus the new book. That makes sense. I, so And it also does give you um, a chance to see those in action anyway, so this way that becomes more feedback from the community as far as how things work. So do the DMs have, like, a feedback system like that, like, Oh, we use this one book plus the PHP, and it was still a mess. Or, well, yeah, I mean, there's definitely uh, going to be that. I mean, we have uh, we have the the Facebook group, the Google Plus groups, and we have the regular groups, and then we also have DM groups. And I mean, anyone can join the, join those, but they're just usually more, uh, you know, more talk about specific rules, more talk about rulings people have made, and the adventures. Um, and so, to get back to the actual original question, is are there plans on modifying that rule? So people want, you know, now that more books are coming out, like Xan Xanathar's Guide to Everything is going to have a bunch of subclasses. And so some people are wanting us to make that PHP plus two, basically. Um, but I can say at this time, that's that's not going to happen. It is something we talk about on a regular basis. Um, and that rule has mostly been um, kind of handed down straight from Wizards. And Mike Merles even said that he kind of wishes they put that in the player's handbook. Um uh, so if there's ever another printing uh, or whatever of it, maybe they will. You know, if they had a rat, they they might do that. So I don't really see that um, ever changing. All the all the admins like the like that rule. All the adventures lay admins like the rule. So again, I don't see it changing. I know people. You know, some people are like, oh, you're constraining my creativity because I can't make a tabaxi swashbuckler, you know, or something like that. And you know, yes, it is to a limit. But again, we have to play with everybody. We we're making organized play f for everybody. And in order to do that, sometimes we have to work in, uh, within some constraints. Huh. That's kind of interesting that uh, Morales is like, and yeah, we should have put that in the PHP. But at the yeah. point, there were no other books either. So Right, yeah. 
And you know, sometimes you imagine they're just trying to get done this pro project, <laughs> let yeah. alone think of the next, you know, ten ten ahead of ahead of themselves, like yeah, chess sure. masters. <laughs> yeah. So what's up, Doug? Oh, I was just gonna say we got Dan Dillon in the chat, so he was helping answer some questions too. But um, yeah, I want to say you know, as far as the PHB plus one, it I mean, sure, it can kind of limit that, but at the same time. You know, there's plenty of options just using your imagination. And, I mean, you could just play your tabaxi like a swashbuckler. It might not have the mechanical right. thing. Yeah. But overall, I mean, the Adventures League and, and the DMs that I've played with have done a really good job of just, like, it's balanced, so you don't need to, like, min-max and have, like, the uber, you know, every mechanical advantage thing. I mean, there's plenty of opportunities for action and excitement in your adventures and role-playing and social stuff, so... Mm -hmm. It depends what player you're talking about. <laughs> sure. Hey, Dan, thanks for uh, helping out in the chat. Appreciate it, buddy. And he was also sure. pointing out that I believe what he was pointing out is the Mystic and Artificer will soon be available from the DMs Guild, and that makes them viable for Adventure League? So right, they're actually already on the DMs Guild. Um, uh, the Wizards put them out recently on the DMs Guild uh, as a, a, a another playtest. Um and Mike Merles had, you know, has said that in their next iteration um, on the DMs Guild, then they will be uh, legal for Adventures League kind of play slash play test. So that's a new way to do things. Previously, we kind of said that things will not be, you know, all the stuff from the Unearthed Arcana will not be Adventures League legal until they're in a book. Um, so that's slightly changed now that, you know, if Wizards says they're going to be Adventures League legal for play test, then, um, then they will be. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I guess I, I, I already knew they're in there, but I get the next generation. And that's kind of weird too. It kind of makes me, it makes me think they've totally gone the Windows route, <laughs> <laughs> or the video game route. You know, now mm -hmm. we have patches, right? That'll, right, that'll right. come out through the DMs Guild. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, there's sort of already, you know, there, there, there's already a Rata and whatnot. Um, that's the same sort of thing. But well, yeah. I wanted to shout out, uh, say hi to Dan. So Dan Dillon, uh, if you see him talking in the chat, um, I've uh, you, you probably know his name from a lot of Kobold Press stuff that he works on. He was part of the Four Horsemen. Um, and he is one of the admins, along with myself, um, Travis Whittle, uh, Paige, um, Paige Lightman, a bunch of folks that, that we run the D&D 5th Edition group on Facebook. So if you search for D&D 5th Edition as groups on Facebook, it's a group of nearly uh, of like ninety four thousand people, um, and so he's one of the admins. He does a good job. Yeah, we we had uh, Dan on um, not too long ago, but I mean, I guess it seems like forever ago now. We're on <laughs> episode uh, sixty one, and he was on fairly early. So yeah, it was it was cool to talk with Dan. Also, another person we got to meet in person, which was great. Yeah, yeah. And he's a freaking giant, by the way. He is a giant, yes. Nice. <laughs> Online, everybody's like this big. Right. <laughs> but uh, you start meeting everybody in person. I really just it just made me feel it just that uh, you know drove home my inferiority already complex about being short. <laughs> I was excited to meet Dan at the at Origins too because I Bobby. use a lot of those products that he's written for, so yeah. that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, that fifth edition Facebook group is really good. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's the internet, so you get your snarky people or whatever. But generally, like, everybody's really positive. And the best thing about that community is how many times I see people like, this is my first time playing d and I'm playing yeah. d and for the first time tomorrow. It's like, yes, it's awesome to see so many people mm -hmm. playing the game these days. Yeah, that is, that is fun. Yeah, uh, yeah we, you, we definitely are getting a lot of new blood in the hobby. You know, uh, one of the new fans that came up to us at uh, Origins, he's like, I've, I've been gaming for two months now, and he was already at his first con, so that was really cool. Oh, it yeah, took me like amazing. 20 years to get to my first con. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and same thing with playing in any kind of organized play. Like, you know, much like you said, I played in all home, home games, you know. So I guess mm -hmm. I've always been fortunate enough to have a group where, you know, thankfully there is, you know, Adventure League out there for people that don't have a group and they can just show up and mm -hmm. roll some funny-shaped dice. <laughs> yep. Which is awesome. Yeah, I wanted to just give a thanks to Robert and other people that do what he do does for building the community. I mean, like you just said, when we were growing up, there wasn't an internet or anything. But now mm -hmm. it's like you can connect with so many people and just you know learn about games and find other players. It's just really awesome the way Wizards is is growing the community around D and D. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, it's it's it is amazing. You know the the access that people have to to meet people 
um, not only just to meet other people that are into it, but like to meet uh, people that work at the companies that you, you know, you like, you know, it's, it's a sort of a double edged sword. I know, you know, I know some designers that, uh, you know, always get hit with questions and they're like, wow, like there's just so much, you know, so many people asking questions of them. Um, but it's also great that you can also, you know, ask Chris Perkins uh, or, or Jeremy Crawford on Twitter and, you know, they'll answer you, you know, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is an awesome time time to be a nerd to be a geek we you know we have such uh, access to people like we never did before and to mm -hmm. the hobby as a whole like i had you know like someone on twitter was like you know i just moved to a new area and i can't find the game like i don't know how i don't know how anyone can not find the game at this point you <laughs> might not be able to game in person yeah yeah there's so much like so i also do work with fantasy grounds uh i do their social media work and so, you know, it's it's never been easier to find not only an in-person game, but an online game. Uh, I run I run a Patreon as well, and we play some Adventures League stuff. And I've had people from Australia, people from Russia in my game. So it's 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 pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's very diverse, very diverse. You mm -hmm. know, when you get into online gaming, and I've played with people on you know nearly every continent now. So that's that part is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, uh, while we continue to chat, if you want to start the roll call and let us know where you're from, you can drop that over there in the chat. Uh, yeah, so. You know, I, I admittedly there are some player areas where you know you, but they're going to be a little more remote and there may not be as much population, so that you can't find games. But mm -hmm. like you said, there's Roll Twenty, there's Fantasy Ground, there's the Tabletop One Shot Group, which has got like seven thousand people in it over on Facebook yeah. where they're playing games all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the App Tab guys, they have a community where games are being played. Company the Nag, our own Facebook group is is small, but games are still getting played over there as well. So. Mm -hmm. If you want to find a game this day and age, you can find one. Whether you want to use a virtual tabletop or just theater of the mind with, you know, Google Hangouts or something or Skype, it's so doable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are you mostly gaming online, offline, combination? Um, I a combination because uh, I've got uh, I had two regular weekly games. I just dropped one because I just didn't have time. But um, so now I have uh, I guess a bi-weekly every two week game. Um, I run a Dark Sun Five E game custom Dark Sun 5e game. Uh, and then uh, about at least once a month, I fly to a different convention around the country and I run games there. And then uh, about, I run six, I run like eight sessions a month online uh, for my patron. So does Adventure League send you to all these different conventions to run games? Uh, Adventures League does not, the conventions do. So I fly okay. out as a guest of the convention. Um, and then, so uh, we have a pro one of the programs that we have in Adventures League is called the Author Only Program, and what that is is uh, any any of the admins. So there's six of us AL admins. Any of us or anybody from Wizards um, uh, on the D and D team can write a module and run it at a convention or at run it anywhere. Um, and those are AL legal. So we just have to get like our little blurb and outline approved by Wizards, and then we can run our our, our game. Um, and so those games we can put on the DMs Guild. Only one of them so far has been put up there. But um, like I've been running, I have two of them that I run, um, and I've been running them for about a year now, just over a year. And so I've run them quite a bit. I've run them quite a bit online and in person. So I'm about ready to retire those and then write write some new ones. And then I will write those up and put them on the DMs Guild for other people to um, buy and run. So for right now, they're somewhat limited, and so people are willing to pay to play them. Uh, either online or fly me out or fly any of the all, all of us admins have them uh, so fly us out to conventions to be guests we also do you know uh, panels we also bring the magic item trading post for, for people to get different magic items and other cool like guild memberships and maybe you can get a tressum as a familiar and different things you can buy in character that you normally can't buy that's a pretty sweet gig yeah like yeah. uh yeah, you know, like me and Doug were talking earlier, like some of the conventions, in my opinion anyway, cost so little to go to. Like, you know, I would have to actually just want to run the game. It's like that wouldn't be an incentive for, you know, having your tickets for free isn't really an incentive. Like we, mm -hmm. I went to one where I ran it and I like literally it was like $35 for the week. And I'm like, my time is worth way more than that. I, you know, I ran because <laughs> yeah. I wanted to run. It wasn't really sure. the, like the $35 doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but your flight. That's another matter entirely. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a nice perk. Mm -hmm. It is nice for sure. 
Uh, so let's get started with the roll call. I don't know if you saw in the chat over there, Robert. Um, yeah. Doug was asking about something. Uh, let's see. Uh, we got Eridaz in Houston. We've got Boston in the house with Garrett. Indiana, Zach. Poison in Quay, as usual. Scott is, in his, Scott is in South Carolina. Mitchell in Michigan. Kurt is in Knoxville. We got Illinois in the house. We got Jeremy from Central Florida. Andrew from Boston. And she jumped on me. Uh, and where were we? You were uh, at a Fragonator in Washington yeah, State. Yeah, just found her. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. And we got uh, T. Odin, West Australia. Hey, what time is it over there? What's up, buddy? It's probably yeah. like the middle of the night. Right. Uh, he's actually a streamer with a pretty large following. He does a lot of Overwatch. He like nice. uh, does the character. He kind of plays the game in character. We got Jimmy in Ventura. We've got Bob in Small Rocks, Ar Ar Arkansas. We have Richard in Orlando, Florida. Steve in Phoenix. Amaroth Eng in the Czech Republic. Nice. nice. We got Spider Thirty Four in New York City. Randy Morris in, in Annapolis, Maryland. We got Kyle in uh, Jersey, our non-paid volunteer. Uh, Ryan Parker in North Carolina. We got Slushy365 in Madison. Brian in New York City. And all right. So nice. It's great <laughs> to see from people all over the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so basically what happened there is what happens every time is like we keep talking. They start the roll call. We keep talking and they go to they go to us talking. And then as soon as the roll we start saying the roll call, they go back to throwing places up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got some Mexico in the house too. Nice. Nice. Yeah, this is Dublin, Ireland, mm -hmm. France. <laughs> Score all over the world playing D&D. Yep. &D. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, Robert, you'd mentioned that you did, you know, you didn't, have, you had to, uh, some time constraints for your other game. Is that because of your new position that you recently got? Um, uh, it's not from that new position, but that new position is I'm also doing uh, social media for um, uh, for Maze Arcana. So they are, uh, in case people don't know, they uh, they started off doing an Eberron stream. Um, with like official permission from Wizards of the Coast, so Rudy Rutenberg and Satine Phoenix, um, uh, they are uh, uh, actors and, and and people in um, LA, and they have a group of people that are also actors and voice actors, and they do um, they were running Eberron, and then now since the stream of Annihilation from Wizards of the Coast, they announced that they are going to be having two shows on um, on the D and D stream. Uh, and so they are, they're really blowing up lately. They streamed live from, um, from origins with the wizards folks too. So, um, I'll be helping them out with their social media as well. That's awesome. Uh, so you got a lot of cool clients uh, right now for that you're managing communities for. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, um, I, I feel very blessed to be able to, you know, not only do the social media work, but also write adventures for adventures league and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, be probably one of the few people that actually makes a living in, in the RPG industry. <laughs> Awesome. So are they Congrats. gonna be streaming are they gonna be streaming four games a week now? Uh yeah, I think it is something crazy. Uh I mean we, I just started really working with them like the day before Origins is when we kind of signed our contracts. So I really need to dig into all of that and make sure that I uh you know have everything in my head for when yeah, when they're gonna be online so I can make sure to uh announce it properly. I believe they're they, I believe they were doing two a week of their own game mm -hmm. before they started with the D and D stream. Yeah, and if yeah. they're doing twice a week for D and D as well, right? It, and it's crazy too because they'll do. Um, I I know definitely on the the Sunday game they do they do the stream, and then they replay the stream with them kind of like doing commentary mm -hmm. and hanging out with people in the chat. Uh, why why the stream is going? Yeah, on the second running, so that's mm -hmm. a pretty cool mm -hmm. thing that they do. Yeah, that is cool. It's like the director's cut, except for the director <laughs> is like right there with you live. Right, 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 and all the players, yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. That part I wasn't sure about. I didn't know if it was just um, uh, Rudy and Satine, or if it was you know the whole gang was there for the replay or not. It just depends. Yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen some of the uh, some of the players, and I've seen Chris Lindsay on there when they were doing other stuff. So yeah, they're doing a yeah. bunch. So, uh, did you have any big big takeaway moments, aha moments, or uh, unexpected surprises at this uh, this Origins? You know, uh, so I've been running 
mostly running my like my author only is mostly what I do when I go to conventions. So I've run it uh, each of them like a hundred times or something. But I'm constantly uh, surprised um, at players because there's pretty much every single convention I go to, something happens that's never happened in the game before. And so uh, it's like this time there's like this chasm in one of the rooms and they're trying to get to the, to this other room. Uh, and so player was like uh, in Misty, what is it called? I uh, can't think of the name of the spell, but basically they become Misty and can fly. And he flies, he's like, I fly down the chasm to see what's down there. And nobody has ever done that in, you know, running it a hundred times. And so I'm constantly surprised at, um, at players, you know, when they um, do something different. Um, aside from that, um, the convention itself was amazing. There were like the amount of, um, of cool imagery that the D&D folks uh, gave to Dave to put up, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen pictures, but they put out huge, like 20 foot by, I don't know, seven or eight foot banners that have um, images from the Tomb of Annihilation stuff. They brought the people, um, uh, Holly Conrad, and uh, I forget the other woman's name, um, but they dressed them up as goblins. They created their own kind of goblin outfits and dressed them up and walked them around and stuff. And you could take pictures and stuff with them. So it's really becoming a, a you know, a, a much more, uh, uh, I don't know, a bigger event than they, yeah, thank you, uh, Danny Hartel, um, uh, a bigger event than just, you don't just go there to play D&D, you know, there's, it's definitely an experience. Uh, yeah, we, we had a little bit of a moment with, uh, with, uh, with those guys, uh, the first night we were there, huh, dog? You want to retell that? It was kind of your moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, earlier in the night, I had seen how, uh, Holly Conrad, and I've been a big fan of hers for years, mm -hmm. and, uh, I was like, ah, I don't know if that's her. I didn't want to just walk up and be like, hey, oh, no, nope, you're not her. But uh, <laughs> then really, later I realized, like, oh, okay, that's her. And uh, somebody we'd met at the con, we were just hanging out with. I'm like, I'm going to use you as an excuse. So I just walked up. I'm like, yeah, my friend's really nervous, and she wanted a picture with you. It was actually me. But I didn't nice. get a picture. So I got to get to uh, my fan moment there with nice. Commander Halley. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, they they had streamed um, them sculpting the the goblins. Yeah, those guys had done a stream for that. And when uh, when they when Doug had brought them back over to the table and we're talking, and I'm like, you know what? I think I know these guys from somewhere. And I don't actually think it was cosplay. And I was like, oh, then it hit me. I'm like, oh right, you guys did the stream. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd been watching it while they were you know doing, when I was doing some other work. But uh, yeah, the, those goblins were freaking amazing. They were crazy. They they were jungle awesome. goblins. Mm -hmm. Atari, they're called. Yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, so that's all cool. All the art that they had all over the place at Origins was insane. All mm -hmm. those murals. Me and Doug are like, you think? I was telling Doug, you think they'll notice? They would notice if we uh, took some of these with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The nerd yeah, think, sweat. Yeah, everybody so, was saying that. I was like, Dave, how do I get some of these for my house? <laughs> So I got a, a, a question we usually ask the guests is uh, how, how did you uh, how and when did you start start gaming Robert? Uh, you know it was just um, uh, I was in eighth grade and it's really funny like I don't remember uh, what we were doing exactly but one of my friends cousins was like do you guys want to play a game and we we're like yeah and so he basically ran us just through theater of the mind we didn't even have any rules or anything. Um, and it was just uh, kind of a choose your own adventure, more or less. Although we did like pick numbers for combat and he just told us we hit based on what we picked or whatever. Um, and so I didn't even know that D&D was a thing. It was just this game we played. And then, uh, so based on that, and, and I had probably, you know, played some video games like, you know, uh, Zork or Bard's Tale or something like that at the time. So this was, you know, uh, late 80s, um, early 90s and late 80s. And so I... I created a game myself based on the same idea and based on these video games that I played. And then I, then I found out about D and D after that. And so I was like, Holy cow, I can't believe I created, we created the same thing. And, and then we found out about D and D. And so uh, I bugged my mom for, you know, for months and months to try to get me the, the red box set, the, the basic set, but she, you know, you know, was like, Oh, it's, it's the devil and all that stuff. Finally, I wore her down and she, you know, it's like pretty much every day, she would be like, just remember, it's only a game. It's only a game. <laughs> and, uh, and so finally I got uh, uh, sick of that. And I was like, all right, you just sit here and watch us play this game. And so she did. And she never said anything else about it after that. <laughs> and she was probably like, I want to play the game now. It's fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, 
Who did, I, who did I hear? Someone told me, I forget who told me this, but their mom secretly recorded them playing like a half a session. Cause they, <laughs> cause they like, I guess the mom didn't want to like tell them, no, you couldn't do it. But that they, it was probably during that time with all the, the devil worship craze. And she, mm -hmm. and she wanted to know what it was about. Yeah. That's fine. And then, and uh, you know, she eventually like broke down and confessed and she says like, she had felt so guilty about doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that's pretty good parenting. You know, you checked it out. You were kind of unobtrusive, and uh, you know, right? Yep. Came to came to your own conclusions. You didn't, you know, listen to the hype and hysteria, hysteria of the media. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, how long have you been gaming now? You said eighth grade. You started. Yeah. So that was uh, like ninety, eighty nine, ninety. So twenty five years or so. A little while. A little while. Mm -hmm. I feel so you there. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are. We're still grown ups playing make believe. What do you know? Yep, yep. Yeah. I uh I, I got out of it for like a little while. Um, and that was only because I uh I grew up in Phoenix, so I played, you know, forever, and then I decided to do some work um in the wilderness. So I was doing wilderness uh, therapy for at risk youth kids. And so that took me to like little towns in Idaho, little towns in New Mexico. Um, then I was traveling a lot and like, I was in the woods for like two weeks at a time. And so I never, you know, during that time I didn't play and that was a good, like three years. And then when I came, um, once I got kind of, I got tired of living in little tiny towns. Cause like I said, I'm from Phoenix from a big city. And so I got sick of living in little towns and I really wanted to, um, uh, get back into, well, come back to a town so I could play D and D, but also get back into martial arts. Cause I'd done martial arts for years and years. Um, and so I found a place where I could be a live-in uh, Uchideshi, which is a live-in student here in Denver. Uh, and so I studied Aikido, you know, for like eight hours a day. And while I was doing the chores that I needed to do in the dojo, um, I would listen to the Tome Show podcast. And that got me into fourth edition. And then once they uh, announced that they were doing Dark Sun, I was like, well, I got to play because I'm a, the biggest Dark Sun geek you'll ever meet probably. And so, uh, so that's really what got me back into uh, into D and D. So, note to self: do not attack Robert. Other <laughs> note to self: trick other people into attack attacking Robert because it's probably going to be hilarious. <laughs> yeah. What I what I was thinking is that I'm I'm guessing a lot of uh, time doing those other things probably came up with ranger builds, monk builds, or <laughs> right. ranger monk builds. Walked, it. It's yeah. like yeah, I'm I'm like a For ranger. Sure. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Like a ranger monk, yeah. Well, yeah. actually, what I was thinking from what I know about you know being in the wilderness through Boy Scouts is most of those most a lot of people have learned come to D and D from Boy Scouts. So mm -hmm. you should have probably just took your books with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the bad thing is I would have had to carry them, and they are not light. <laughs> <laughs> That is true. I brought all my D and D books to Origins, and nev they never left the uh, hotel room. <laughs> right? Yeah. Say if we're gonna have to D and D eyes, Robert. No. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, D and D eyes. <laughs> D and D eyes. Oh, like make it make me a D and D. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, make you a D and D character. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, you know, social worker uh, background with uh, <laughs> monkey yeah. ranger multi class. There you go. <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. So. One of the things that I discovered from going to Origins, there was a bunch of people there that I didn't get to meet. So mm -hmm. we're gonna have to put, we're gonna have to put up a, a nerd, put together a nerdarchy system to making sure we meet up with people. Yeah. We yeah. definitely we definitely had enough people where we could have ran our own games. <laughs> so that, that would be awesome. We did get to play in um Steven Rose game, uh, oh, cool. which is actually the first time I played Pathfinder in like four years. Um and it was you know, it was me, Doug, and Megan. So that so that was really cool. We uh, you know, were able to get together with several of the staff writers mm -hmm. and get some gaming going on and as well as uh her fiance and her little brother. Uh, Max, who again, what's with kids? They all want to be evil when they play, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, they're, they, yeah, I think it's just uh, suppression going on. <laughs> yeah, I they love stealing things. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a, a lot problems. of new players, a lot of new players that, that even at my table, it's like everybody just their first fantasy thief. It's like they're just trying to rob things, rob people immediately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's a, that's a common fantasy. What, what happened to be uh, playing and being the hero? Yeah. Right? yeah 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 yep i think uh you know in the in the 90s a lot of that changed you know with like a, the you know the darker heroes and stuff like that mm -hmm. anti-heroes and all that yeah. stuff and so it's, it's marvel's fault yeah. <laughs> yeah. they started it with punisher and it was like oh well they're probably wolverine then punisher then it was all kind of downhill from there mm -hmm. yeah uh, 
I got to mention, uh, you know, you said you're a big Dark Sun fan, which many D&D players love that uh, campaign setting. Mm-hmm. And uh, earlier in the year when the they said the code name for the new product line was Dust, I was like, Dust, Silt, like maybe it's Dark Sun. So that <laughs> yeah, was my yeah. question. Like, come on, please. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's just too far removed from Forgotten Realms for them. <laughs> yeah, there's Anurak Desert. You could, you could throw it in there. There you go. <laughs> Dark Sun uh, transported. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, it, yeah, it's always interesting, you know, having, you know, having the the burden of knowledge of kind of what the next few seasons are. And, you know, you see people, you know, uh, speculate and then they have to ask you, you're just like, I, I'm not saying anything. Can't say anything. <laughs> huh. So, so, you know, the next couple seasons. All right. No, another mm-hmm. note to sell. Get Robert really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I had to actually leave early uh, from from Origins, or or I w- probably would have spent some time getting people drunk uh, Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, Saturday Saturday was a late night for a lot of us. <laughs> yeah, I, I assumed it would have been. Yeah, I, I was already getting enough flack about being gone for Father's Day, and then unfortunately, uh, my partner Ted, who I'm married to, his sister, their grandmother passed away Friday during the afternoon, uh-huh. and and I had found out later Friday night. So I'm like, well, I'm not going to leave now. So, and then we also had Megan coming in from out of town. So I was like, you know what? I'll stay, meet Megan, hang around a little bit, and then you know, shoot on home to the to the family and uh, spend some time with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so it was good though. Origins. That, you know, that that's the first big con I've been to, and I'm really excited oh, for Gen Con. So I guess we'll get to hang out again there. Uh, no, I will not be at Gen Con. Uh, it's uh. It's just, it's too big for me. <laughs> uh, it no. really is. It's huge. What about, uh, will you be making it to PAX Unplugged? Um, not at the moment, although, I mean, I, 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 I might, but um, like I said, most of these, so here's the thing is usually um, if a con is going to be big enough to like have wizards there, they'll have wizards there instead of me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or instead of the other admins. Um, so, you know, all of us admins get invited to different cons, you know, some local um, but sometimes, like Claire and I, will be going out to Gateway in um, in September in uh, LA, and so you know it just depends on on, on the con. Okay, actually, so oh. go ahead, Doug. I was gonna say well, something you said. Actually, the conversation reminded me of something I wanted to mention. Was uh, a lot of people at the con at Origins, you know, they, it's fun and everything, but they said that same thing. Like it's too big for them. I just wanted to mention, like, there's tons of little conventions all over the place mm-hmm. and they're great places to just play games and meet new people so i mean you know you got your big tent pole conventions all year but you know, if you look around and find these smaller things you are bound to find games and people to play with and make new friends and memories so i just want to mention that yeah yeah so if you uh if you go to conmap.dndadventuresleague.org you can see a map that is kept up by the community and it has all the conventions. Uh, I mean, not all of them, but if people put a convention in there, you know, like if the organizers put them there, it will be there. And all these conventions will have Adventures League. There's a way to specify if you're having a premiere adventure, if you're having con created content, if you're having um, the, any of the admins there, it'll like highlight your con and stuff. So um, definitely check it out. Um, we're also going to be adding a, like a thing for groups. So like your local groups can be, can put themselves on there if they're looking for players or whatever. So that's definitely one way to find find some games. Us. We just Locally. lose. The, uh, yeah, I just lost you for a second there. Uh, am I back? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Uh, sometimes the Googles, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. No, but that's excellent. That's a great way for one for people to check out the you know the different cons where they can go and play with maybe new people, uh, and also just being connect you know ways for them to connect with folks that are nearby them. Yeah. Well, so that that's always great. Uh, before we, uh, so, you know, if we're going towards the end, there was a good question I thought from one uh, earlier. It was from Dalen Johnson. He says, "So how does Adventures League work with each campaign? Take Princes of the Apocalypse, for example. Does it use the adventure book, or is it totally different than the adventure books?" So both. Um, you know, you can you can just run the the main hardcover campaign book if you want to do that you can just run our adventures you know the the small pdfs if you want to do that or you can combine them um so it really uh as long as you're playing um you know with by the rules and as long as you're like in a good spot to stop usually it's better it's better if you're 
you know, if you don't just like jump from, you know, like, oh, we're in the middle of a siege and now I'm in this other adventure. So there's a there's a little bit of like, uh, uh, you know, suspended reality sort of that you have to go through uh, because some of the adventures, you know, are in the Moon Sea region. Some are in the uh, some are in the Sword Coast and like next season they're going to be in Chult. So like if you're playing in Chult and then the next adventure you play is on the Moon Sea, you know, there's a little bit of uh, suspension of disbelief. You know, it's just just like it happens in a, in a you know in a movie or like in a TV show, they might be in one place and then the next time they're in somewhere else. And it's like you don't necess- in a home game you might you might play through that travel time, right? If it was a completely custom campaign, but an adventures league campaign, you sort of just ha- hand wave that. And unless it's unless the travel is part of the adventure, you know, you just kind of say you're over where you need to be. And you get so, the Indiana Jones uh, map where it's just the plane going. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yep. Personally, I prefer the Muppet montage myself, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's why we need Ebron. So you could just jump on the lightning rail and get and there, there or, or totally. grab an airship ride. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. There, are, there are some adventures that are uh, new from the book, though, like the uh, Out of the Abyss. Those Hillsfire ones are related to that, but that's I don't yeah, think that's so, in the book, right? No, yeah, those aren't the, are not in the book. Um, I mean, even even with so all of the Adventures League adventures are outside of the book. Um, they might take place in some similar location. So one of the things we're we're going we're going to do from now on is that we're going to tie our adventures as closely as we can to the book. Um, so before they were just themed the same as the book. So our giant adventures had giants, you know. Um, but these, like for season seven, we're trying to be as closely related as possible. So there, you're going to see a lot of the same NPCs that you've seen in the book. Of course, a lot of new ones too. But um, but you know there will be ties. Like we went through, um, read, you know, read the the playtest drafts mm-hmm. and um, tried to come up with like, oh maybe this you know, this NPC knows about this and it's not really dealt with in the book. So we're going to do an adventure about that. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So was that something AL decided to do on their own? Was that something that came from on high? Uh, That was, that was something that came from on high. Uh, They just wanted us, like I said, we started out in the moon sea and completely separate and they just want, they want things to be a lot more tied together. It makes sense. I mean, you know, Perkins and Merles and Crawford and everyone over there, they're just doing such a great job mm-hmm. of running this edition and, and, you know, getting it out there. And also with all the streaming that's getting tied into it, they're, they're blowing up D and D like it's never been blown up before. Mm-hmm. And literally I feel like it, you know, the early products, they kind of outsourced them. And then, you know, I think around curse of Strahd is when they started really taking their, the reins back mm-hmm. And yeah. I, I feel like it's getting a lot better since they have, you know, not, you know, not to just those smaller companies that were working on the stuff before, but I really think the wizards team is just doing a better job. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the, you know, I think they were still working on a lot of stuff, you know, during um, the tyranny of dragon stuff, they were still working on the monster manual and the DMG and everything. And so um, they kind of had to outsource that in order to get those adventures out. And then, once they, um, you know, once they were kind of done and kind of knew where the where the edition was sitting, then they, you know, they had time to write their own. Which is definitely awesome. Hey guys, you know what? I forgot to panhandle the internet, so let me do that real quick <laughs> uh, before we let Robert go. And yeah, you know, we still have the GoFundMe um, going on, and actually ties directly into Robert sort of, uh, because we are raising money to go out to LA to appear on GM Tips with Satin Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And it's an expensive trip, so we would definitely could use a hand with that. If you've already given, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. You're, you guys are helping us so much. If you haven't given, uh, and you can, please do. And if you can't, of course, uh, please just share it out. We appreciate all you guys hanging out with us and, and spending time with us during these daily, daily live chats, watching our videos, hanging out on Facebook and Twitters and, and all over the internet. It was so great this weekend getting to actually meet people in person and live. We're going to get better at organizing these things when we go to places so that we can actually get some gaming in. Like I ran into at least nine people. I'm making it a point to grab pictures with, with folks whenever – Whenever I do, because I was so I'm so disappointed in myself when we did the meet up with with people in Tampa and we didn't get a single picture from that. You know, it was it was a little overwhelming. You mm-hmm. know, we're, we're gaming with the fans and them having to sign all their PHBs and and it was a lot of fun. But I just wasn't thinking. And now I really do miss not having photos of those. You know, with those guys and with the game. 
Mm -hmm. So that is also one of the things we want to do when we get out to LA. We are kind of padding the trip to stay out there longer so that we can actually have time to meet up with fans. And that would be awesome. And if you guys are going to be at Gen Con or PAX Unplug, email us, check us out on social media. Uh, so this way we can have a way to track it and we'll figure out how we can meet up when we're at these places. If you guys want, of course that is. Um, we're right around the hour mark. Is there anything you want to finish off with Robert? And thank you for coming in short notice. Uh, yeah, no problem. I really appreciate, I uh, really appreciate the invite. Um, you know, just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm loving, uh, just working with the community as much as I do in all the different ways I get to, uh, it's great to see the new blood. You know, there's so many new D and D players. Um, so it's great to see everybody when I go to conventions, like if you ever see me at a convention, uh, I pretty much look like my profile picture. And if you're watching here, obviously you see what I look like. Um, but really just stay hi, just stop me and say hi. I mean, even if I'm looking at my phone, cause a lot of times if I'm running games, that means in between the games, the only time I have to, to, to do the other, the social work, social media work I have to do. So even if I'm looking at my phone, stop me and say hello. Uh, it's great to see, uh, you know, all, all of these players, like I said, new players that have come in and old players that, you know, have not played since second edition and fifth edition brought them in. There's a ton of those. So, you know, anybody, if you, if you, if you like dark sun, say hi, you know, I usually wear a dark sun pin or something. So, um, just say hi, uh, you know, I won't bite. <laughs> Yeah, it's a funny story to, story to go along with that. When we actually saw you the first night and we hadn't gone up to you, uh, Doug is Doug is like, is that Robert Aducci over there at, at that other table? I'm like, I don't know. What's he look like? Then he pulls up like, your Facebook profile or something. And I'm like, and he's holding it up, looking at you and looking at his phone. I'm like, I don't know. Go up there and hold it next to the side of his head and ask the guys at the table if they look alike. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so and and behold it was it was who knew and so with that guys until next time stay nerdy stay nerdy